Good morning. It's good to be with you here today. I know things look a little different up front. I'm trying to um, embrace the different growing challenges of, of the stage of pregnancy, but thank you for bearing with me. Um, my name is Pastor Hannah Bowersox. I'm one of the co-lead pastors here at City Hope in case I haven't had a chance to meet you yet. I'm going to say something pretty controversial, but libraries have always made me incredibly uncomfortable. I don't know if anyone can feel me on that. They're definitely more versatile than they used to be. They have children's hours now, and there's sometimes coffee shops in different libraries. But it's, it's the quietness. It's the stillness that gets me. I totally understand if you do not feel this way, but I come from a very loud family. Many of you know that I grew up in the country. I was raised in good old York, New York, which is like at least 30 miles south of here. And... I was raised as a true country kid. My parents owned and still own two and a half acres of, of land with barns and animals. And even though my mom was in real estate her whole career and my dad worked in mental health services for 30 years before retiring and joining her, they loved animals and we always lived a very farmer-esque lifestyle in certain ways. Growing up, we raised turkeys. And in one of those special seasons, of turkey raising, I found a best friend, Buddy the turkey. And this Buddy, he would follow me all around the yard, and as I would sing at the top of my lungs, because I could, we lived in York, New York, he would literally sing with me. Now, I have to, like, give you the actual picture of it, because, well, okay, not an actual picture. I wish I had a picture of Buddy the turkey. That's so sad now that I'm saying it out loud. But the song that I would sing is, I don't know if you know this song, it's an old camp song. He's my rock, my sword, my shield, he's the wheel in the middle of the wheel. He's the lily of the valley, my bright and morning star. Makes no difference what you say, I'll get on my knees and pray, pray. I will sing until the day that Jesus comes. Yeah, It's like ingrained in my memory forever. It's one of those songs that you replace certain words as you go, right? So kind of like deep and wide, deep and wide, there's a fountain flow. It's like hmm and wide, hmm and wide, and you keep replacing each word each, each round. This one eventually goes, he's my ha-ha-ha, I can't even do it anymore. Yeehaw, okay? So that's what it is. And Buddy, when I would get to the whoop, would just go like crazy. And we would follow all over the yard. We would just be singing our little joyful song. So you can imagine with turkeys as best friends, and fields as our neighbors, we didn't really have to worry about being quiet. We could laugh and yell and sing and talk until our faces turned blue. No one would be bothered in the slightest, which is why it always felt like such a strong and uncomfortable contrast when we would enter our neighboring town's tiny little Caledonia library. And I would feel like I had suddenly gone deaf because there was this absence of sound. Just 100%, you walked in and there was nothing there. And that was always scarier to me than, than loud noises that I had grown up with. Of course, I got used to it after a while. You kind of have to. You learn that you can't just always be talking with your outside voice in school. And I learned how to slowly talk quieter in settings like libraries and different environments. But even all the way through college, I, I just libraries gave me the heebie-jeebies, which is unfortunate when you're in academia for four years and you need to use libraries to feel that way. But I remember only being able to write papers in our college coffee shop or in our campus center because that's where there was this energetic buzz of people talking and music in the background, and it was just enough for me to be able to focus. So what happens when someone who is not naturally a fan of silence is challenged to see silence as a good thing. To view the discipline of being silent, both physically and mentally, as a way to draw closer to God. The older I have gotten, the more I realize that I use sound as a distraction all the time. As a way to mute, or at the very least dull, that inner dialogue that is constantly going on in my heart and mind. And maybe you can resonate with this a little bit. You find yourself using music or TV shows or TikTok reels or even reading as a way to distract you from your current frustrations or discontentedness or pain or sadness. You hope that maybe, just maybe, with all of that noise 
you'll be able to drown out the negative feelings of anxiety or despair that creep up on you when you least expect it. I know I have done this often in the past, but honestly, I wasn't super aware of my subconscious reason for avoiding silence in my life until I came face to face with this challenge of embracing silence as an actual gift from God. Like we learn about in our studies this week, In our passage of scripture today, the Apostle Paul addresses a very similar concept. He encourages his listeners to, even when there is suffering and difficulty, to be disciplined and steadfast in their faith. To not avoid the uncomfortable feelings of chaos and pain and try to drown them out, but instead use those moments to more deeply embrace God. Peter is writing from most likely Rome, to a group of Jewish and Gentile believers scattered throughout Asia Minor, which is modern-day Turkey. And his central message to these believers, who are already facing persecution and continue to face persecution all the way through Emperor Nero, is to hold firm in their faith, even through temporary trials and hardships. But it's easy to just accept that sentence without blinking an eye. It's easy for us to hear something on the news and compartmentalize it in our heads. It's not happening to us. It's okay. Everything's going to be okay. But just like the innocent Palestinian children and Israeli children who are suffering across the world, these Christians in this moment, they're not facing little struggles that we can just shrug away. Peter is writing to a group of people whose lives are in danger. Their families' lives are in danger. They live in this day-to-day uncertainty. There is true fear, not like the fear I have of making phone calls, which I'm telling you is a true fear, but it doesn't come close to that because it's life or death. This is true hardship, hardship that many of us really can't actually resonate with. And yet, Peter isn't just writing to these first century Christians. He's writing to us today. Centuries later, these believers living in totally different contexts with totally different problems, and he's challenging us to do the same thing he's challenging those first century Christians to do. So after some of that background, let's go ahead and dive into the text today. We're going to be reading 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 through 11 in the NRSV translation. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, so that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all of your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert like a roaring lion. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Steadfast in your faith, For you know that your brothers and sisters in the world are all undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will he himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Over the last few weeks, we've been in a church-wide series on spiritual disciplines. We've been working through a book called Spiritual Disciplines Handbook by Adele Calhoun, and we've been challenging ourselves with some pretty tough inner work. The last couple of weeks, we've covered spiritual direction and discernment, simplicity, and unplugging. And today, we're going to talk about two more disciplines that are not often talked about, silence and sobriety. Like I've explained before, Adele has come up with 75 disciplines, and we do not have enough time in this series to cover them all. Though if you have a book, you are welcome to do that in your free time. So we had to to narrow it down, and there's these seven major umbrellas she divides all these disciplines into. And this week and last week, we decided to stay in part three, to double down on part three, which is relinquishing the false self. Basically, shedding our coping mechanisms and getting real with who God created us to be, drawing closer to him in that process. But as I've read the chapters and I've dove into the exegesis of the text and researched what I was going to be talking about today, I had to wrestle with the question, how on earth do I tie these two subjects together, the discipline of silence and the discipline of sobriety? And then it dawned on me, 
the root cause of the issues we're fighting against with the help of these disciplines is our inability to sit in our grief, our pain, our anxiety, and our discomfort. It's our inability to sit there that is the root cause of why we struggle with the things we do. And if we want to be fully alive as Christians, living abundant lives in Jesus, no matter the circumstances, like these first century Christians, we have to learn how to sit in uncomfortable feelings. We have to learn how to rid ourselves of those vices and dependencies if our true desire is to be dependent on God alone. We have to to sit there to really experience the freedom he offers. Here's the main connection I realize. It's only when we become comfortable in the experiences we have in silence that sobriety and freedom are actually possible. Most of the time, our habits and addictions or dependencies stem from hurt or anxiety, a discomfort with being left alone in the silence of only our thoughts to keep us occupied. But today in this week, we get to explore how sitting in silence with God, how being disciplined in our sobriety for God actually allows us to open ourselves up to him in a far more vulnerable and powerful way. I think we often only think of sobriety in terms of a struggle with addiction, hard addiction, drugs, sex, alcohol. We think of it in terms of our uncle who goes to AA or our friend who doesn't realize she's overly dependent on wine and needs help. But sobriety is so much more than that. Practicing sobriety is helpful for all people because it encourages us not to be reliant on anything other than God, to not use Instagram or coffee or even our innocent Kindles as a form of escape from our lives. The discipline of sobriety is rooted in the understanding that God is all we need. Even in times of chaos and pain, like in our passage today, we can persevere because God is on our side and we can go to him for help. I'll admit, I myself have many soft addictions. I I don't like going a day without coffee or chocolate or long drives or my specific forms of entertainment. Even when I get into my reading kicks, which I'm so proud of because it means I'm not binging Netflix, it's often too far in the other direction. You can ask Justin this. Like, I, it's all I think about. When I wake up in the morning, when I go to bed at night, that book, one more chapter, is all I can think about when I'm in that zone of reading. And even though it's a good thing, just hearing that, I'm sure raises some red flags to you. Like, it sounds like she's a little bit a slave to her Kindle at times. But what about you? What are some things that you don't realize maybe that you've grown dependent on? It could be online shopping, TV, even exercise not in moderation is unhealthy for us. Statistics show that, not just physically, but mentally as well. When you've had a bad day or it's been a hard season, what's your go-to pick-me-up, your go-to feel-good? It's not bad to have things to enjoy, but it isn't healthy to use them as an escape. I saw a quote that kind of hits the nail on the head, and it's super simplistic, but it says, too much of a good thing is bad, and too much of a bad thing is bad, so too much must be bad. If I asked you, have you ever had a Dorito hangover, would anyone know what I'm talking about? Or you can at least, like, start to, like, think about what that could mean. I can, like, feel, like, it still makes me, it's not a good day to talk about this, because I already feel very nauseous today, but I'm just, like, immediately remembering, like, oh, that feeling is so disgusting. It's that feeling of being at a sleepover or hanging out with friends all night and just, like, having too many M&Ms, right, and too many plates of chips of cookies that, cookies, what? Too many plates of chips that only have that one ingredient and it's red dye, right? It makes you feel so gross and groggy. You have way too little sleep, way too little water. I remember like it was yesterday being at those sleepovers surrounded by friends and snacks and movies and games and just thinking this is literally heaven. I can stay up as late as I want. I can have as many snacks as I want. We can play as many games as we want. And then that inevitable crash would come the next day, right? After your parents had picked you up from the sleepover and you're doing chores in the backyard like stacking wood, which was our favorite chore in the world back then, and it would just hit. You were back in the real world, and you felt miserable, and it was horrible. 
And it's similar to those feelings of the all-nighters that they used to throw for youth. In the Wesleyan Church, it was spring fling at Houghton College. And you'd just be pumped out of your mind all night long, just buzzing around, just doing whatever you wanted. And then at 8 a.m. when you were loading buses, it would hit you like a ton of bricks. That horrible Dorito hangover of lack of sleep and lack of water and too many bad snacks and too much running around at 3 a.m. And suddenly the world was spinning and all those teenage boys were no longer cute, but they smelled absolutely nauseating. Do you remember that? That smell has stuck with me forever. You were jolted back into reality after what felt like consuming only good things, right? Humans aren't great at understanding moderation. We aren't great at setting boundaries and limiting the noise and entertainment and opportunities around us. We need help getting back to the basics. We need help getting healthy, not just physically, but spiritually and mentally and socially. That's why God provides us these opportunities to grow in discipline. He provides us the challenge of, of seeking out sacred spaces like silent retreats. And he provides us challenges like sobriety. He's trying to pull us back to the reality of him and remind us that there is such a thing as too much of a good thing. In moments like this where we're intentional about these disciplines and we take those challenges on, he gets to come closer to us and we can actually hear him whisper that reminder that he is all we need. And sometimes when we try so hard to drown out the chaos and the frustration and overwhelm of our hearts, we also drown him out, don't we? We drown out the very voice that's trying to comfort us trying to help us and correct us and guide us and fill us with everything we need. I'm guilty of this. In both the disciplines of silence and sobriety, we are fighting against our nature to accidentally drown out God along with everything else. In silence, we're able to hear from God in a new way. And in sobriety, we're able to see God provide for us in a new way. In both disciplines, we see that God is more than enough. And we get to hunger for more of him and less of those fleeting desires of this world. In Adele Calhoun's words, silence is a regenerative process of attending and listening to God in quiet without interruption and noise. Silence allows us to free ourselves from the addiction to and distraction of noise so that we can be totally present with God. to open myself to God in a place beyond words. And she says about sobriety, that we're able to live in moderation and full attachment to God without dependence on substances and attachments that are harmful to my life. I've known a few addicts in my life, more than a few, and the heartbreaking reality of addiction, of dependencies on anything other than God is that it never actually takes away the anxiety long term. And you might be able to tell this in your own life. Having those addictions and, and those dependencies never actually solve anything. Those coping mechanisms just make things worse. Every person I've met with a porn addiction specifically says the same thing. I, I usually turn to it when I'm stressed or anxious or sad. I think it'll solve my problems. I think it'll make me feel better. And it does for a moment, and then it only gets worse. The shame sinks in and I feel more enslaved than I've ever felt before. Adele Calhoun seems to have really gotten it right when she says the substance that initially promised some form of release becomes slave master rather than liberator. We cannot control everything that happens to us, but we can control how we respond to every circumstance. We can make up our minds about what we turn to and what we turn from, what we embrace and what we resist. And it's in those moments of pain and suffering and anxiety that when we could choose to cope with porn or alcohol or simply scrolling endlessly online, that instead choosing to cast our cares on God makes the biggest impact. We begin to see that we are so much more than slaves 
to our vices. We are beloved children of God. And that makes all the difference. We begin to see that there's a way out, that it isn't easy. But when we've become disciplined and and practiced in these different areas of our faith, we actually have the courage and the strength to stand up against the devil. And we can be free. The famous quote of Reinhold Niebuhr that's used in recovery programs everywhere helps us look at it differently. God, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, courage to change the things I can, and wisdom to know the difference. We can't control or change everything in our lives, but we can accept the difficult circumstances in our lives and turn back to God for help. We can release our burdens to him and have the courage to face whatever comes our way with perseverance and wisdom. Whatever stronghold that could be in your life right now, whether big or small, I want you to hear the good news this morning. God loves you. There is no burden too big enough for him. What you're going through is not too much for him. You're not too much for him. Trust in him. Lean on him. He cares for you. Let's listen to our scripture again this morning and really hear what God is trying to tell us. Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand that he may exalt you in due time. Cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Discipline yourselves. Keep alert like a roaring lion. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around looking for someone to devour. Resist him. Steadfast in your faith, for you know that your brothers and sisters in the world are all undergoing the same kinds of suffering. And after you have suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, this is my favorite part, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the power forever and ever. Amen. Our passage today was not just meant to encourage those first century Christians against the trials that they were facing at the time to spur them on. It was meant to encourage and challenge all of us. Today we have the good news. God cares for us. God will restore, support, strengthen, and establish us. But we have to be intentional to put ourselves in those positions where we're available to him where we're aware of his presence. As Christ followers, we have to be willing to do the hard work of being disciplined so that God's voice becomes easier for us to notice. I love this quote from commentator Jennifer T. Callan. She says, discipline like humility can be misunderstood. It often has a negative connotation, particularly when it's associated with punishment. However, discipline is repeated actions that are necessary to achieve positive results. It's a method of training. Discipline is waking up every morning to run when you're preparing for a marathon. Discipline results in preparedness and vigilance. Discipline is reading the Bible, praying, and coming together with like-minded people in order to better understand and continue to grow in one's faith. So what does all of this look like for us today? How do we practice the disciplines of sobriety and silence so that even in those hard moments, we're able to draw closer to God and to be taken care of by him? I think, number one, we have to take a serious inventory. It's easy for me to say that right here, and it's easy for you to hear it, but it's harder for us to go home and actually spend that time with God, asking him to reveal in us the things that we may be coping a little too heavily with. We need to ask him, what coping mechanisms are are we using that have replaced our, our, our need for you? How have we become more dependent on these things than on you? Spend time with God taking inventory. Number two, commit to giving up at least one of those things. Whether that's binge watching your favorite TV show for a week or maybe giving up chocolate for the month, The season of Lent is an amazing time to practice sobriety, but this is such a a, a special discipline for us to practice as much as possible. Don't be like me and just replace something with something else, right? Like I I replace TV with my Kindle, or replace all your chocolate with freakish amounts of fruit, whatever it is. 
notice the absence of that thing. Notice what it feels like to give that thing up and, and ask God to challenge you through that. Ask him to, to show you what he wants to show you in that process of practicing sobriety. And number three, I'm going to keep it simple with three main challenges, but set a special extended time with God this week in silence. Whether that's adding 20 minutes to your devotional time or that's spending two weird little hours in the forest by yourself spending time with God. I love that personally. It's been a little more challenging with kids. But it's such a special time. Commit to doing something to extend that time in silence before God and see how he meets you there. Talk with others about it. Find accountability. I know you're not all in groups, but those of you who are in groups, talk to your groups about it. Those of you who aren't in groups, find someone like us to talk to you, to talk about it. I want to hear about how God is changing you in that process. Like all spiritual disciplines, silence and sobriety are truly a gift from God, even when they don't feel like it originally. Trust God to meet you in those challenges and ask him to reveal himself in new ways to you to encourage your heart, especially when it's extra discouraged. Expect that God will meet you and move and that you'll be changed. I think these last two quotes from Adele Calhoun sum it all up. Silence is a time to rest in God, lean into God, trusting that being with him in silence will loosen your rootedness in the world and plant you by streams of living water. I love that quote. It can form your life even if it doesn't solve your life. And sobriety is more than detaching from what is bad. It's attaching to the one who loves me and is utterly good for me. In silence, we are able to hear from God in a new way. And in sobriety, we are able to see God provide in a new way. In both disciplines, we see that God is more than enough. When I was thinking about songs for worship this week, immediately that old 90s song, In the Secret, popped into my head. In the secret, in the quiet place, in the stillness, you are there. In the secret, in the quiet hour, I wait only for you because I want to know you more. I want to know you. I want to hear your voice. I want to know you more. I want to touch you. I want to see your face I want to know you more. And I was like, man, that sums up silence so well. But as I kept reading, I realized how perfectly the second verse fits sobriety. I am reaching for the highest goal that I might receive the prize, pressing onward, pushing every hindrance aside out of my way because I want to know you more. Pushing every distraction, every temptation every coping mechanism and addiction aside because I want to know you more, God, and I don't want anything to stand in the way of that. May we be a people of God who challenge each other to push every hindrance aside. May we be a church who wants to know God more, even if it means diving into that uncomfortable territory of stretching ourselves beyond what we think we're capable of. May we, as the author of Hebrews says, throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance, the race marked out for us. I believe we can be those people and I hope you do too. Let's pray. Lord, you are so good. And even on these dreary October mornings, we notice your goodness all around us. Lord, we thank you for this body of Christ. We thank you for this family. We thank you that you have created such a soft place to land, such a, a soft spot for those who are struggling with questions or addictions or frustrations or feelings of loneliness or despair. Lord, thank you for making this a home to all of us who have felt misplaced or broken. Lord, thank you for creating new life in us. Lord, I pray over those who are grieving today. I pray you would make yourself especially available to them today. That they would recognize that your comfort and your peace is readily available to them. Lord, would you just hold them in their pain and in their suffering and their, their grief. 
would you walk with them? Would you surround them with people who can encourage them and lift them up? Father, for those facing uncertainties and anxiety and, and health problems, Lord, I pray that you would remind them that you are all they need, that you are the great provider, that you love them, that you want what's best for them, no matter what they're struggling with in the, in the moment. Lord, thank you that you meet us there. Thank you that you meet us in the pit. You meet us in the loneliest and darkest places when we think no one else could ever meet us there. When we think we've been hidden away by the world, Lord, you see us and you shine a light that illuminates our path. Lord, may we each trust you in that. Would you draw close to those who are brokenhearted, who are waiting, who are in a season of of just hoping for the best in the future, would you just grant them encouragement? Lord, for the rest of us who are kind of just going about life, trying to keep up with the busyness, trying not to get overwhelmed, would you put a spirit of strength and resilience in us? Lord, we know that you are more than able, and we praise you that you are here to strengthen and support and renew us in every way. Help us to lean more on you, more on that truth that you love us and you gave yourself for us. Thank you, Lord. We love you and we praise you. In Jesus' name, amen. You can go ahead and stand and join us in singing.